could start Kushbu. Yep. Yeah. So welcome everyone. This is third session of uh, Sitco DevOps series organized by Sitco User Group India and presented by Hardeep Bamra and team. Today we have Hardeep Bamra and Sri Harsha Verapalli with us. They will be presenting on Sitecore XP scaled on AKS in multi-region. So if you have any questions during this session, please add it to the chat window. We will try to cover all your questions at the end of the session. Over to you, Hadip. You can start. Hey, thank you. So thank you, everyone, for taking some time and joining the session. Uh, doing multi-region Sitecore XP scale on AKS, um, you know, our session is never going to be enough. There's always going to be uh, some more time. So we'll try to incorporate as much as possible, but it might look like that this probably is going to be a part one and we probably will have the part two also where we would want to show you the uh, the failovers and everything. Uh, in this, we are only going to be talking mostly from and how do you set up an XP scale on a case. Uh, use, you know, we talk about the, uh, the release pipelines, we'll talk about the the manifest files uh, will show you the configurations. We'll walk through the architecture diagram, and there are going to be a few other things. So, it, in all probability, it looks like we might even do a secondary one, but uh, we'll see how it goes, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. So, that's the DevOps series that we have been doing, and uh, we'll continue to bring more content to the community as we keep going forward. We we haven't touched upon a lot of subjects yet. We have been just trying to deploy. We have not even gone in depth of how to write the manifest files or probably how to even create the release pipelines and talk about the securities and a lot of other features. So you will probably keep seeing, we will keep going in a little more depth as we keep making progress. So this is for multi-region site code XP scaled on a case. That's me. I've already introduced myself, so I'll skip this very quickly. If you have any questions, feel free to write me on hpamrighthorizontal.com. That's Sri Harsha. Uh, I call him Sri. Uh, she has been practicing uh, infrastructure deployments uh, for the past 15 years. He is an experienced uh, guy. Uh, he works as part of my team as solution architect. Uh, he's going to be doing the demos. Initially, I'll be showing you most of the stuff related to the architecture and other things, and then uh, Sri will take it out from there. The agenda for today is going to be Sitecore XP scale on AKS with multi-region. We'll also touch upon uh, showing you the manifest files. We'll go through it, how do you really set up the manifest files. We will, we're will. we not going to be really going in detail about how to uh, talk about the structures or you know settings that you need to do, but essentially we'll go through an overview of uh, how you really uh, set up the YAML files. Sri will go through the release pipelines that we have done. He'll show some of the demos. Now, when you when you do a multi-region AKS cluster, remember, you know, if you set up one cluster, it takes about 20, 25 minutes. Okay. Azure being Azure, sometimes you know it's it's fast and sometimes it is slow, depending upon what time of the day you are trying to set it up. So if I try to set up everything from the scratch, it's obviously going to be one hour is not going to be enough. So what we have to do is that we have to do a lot of pre- uh, settings in the back end, for example, make sure that the clusters are up and running, make sure the primary region is up and running. We also have to make sure the second is up and running. We'll go and deploy multiple times. So essentially in this, we will talk about the architecture. We will talk about the manifest files. We'll go to the release pipelines. We also want to have a session for that, for you guys to have some question and answer. So we might not be able to do an exact failover today to show you to you that this is primary reason. And then you, you know, remove one of the, endpoints from the traffic managers and then switch over the traffic to the secondary endpoints. Uh, time permits, we will do that. If time doesn't permit, then we might not be able to do that. So in case if you're not able to win, then we will certainly have a secondary session planned for that. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. All right, let's go and see the architectural diagram, okay? I hope it's it's visible to everyone. Uh, I can certainly zoom in, but I am just mindful that we might lose the, the second option here. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to probably try to zoom in a little bit more. Is this good enough, Kushbu? Yes. Okay. 
I'll try to change these settings and see if it works. Okay, just give me a second. I'll try to bring it on a bigger screen. So just bear with me for a second. I stopped sharing the screen because I can show it to on a bigger screen now. So I'm going to share the screen again. Okay, and then bring in the yeah. This is going to be much better. Okay. All right. So what we are basically doing here is that if you have been following the series, uh, this is the area where we have talked multiple times. Now I have combined everything into one pod here because if I start listing down all the pods separately, the architectural diagram for this demo is going to be too cluttered. Okay, So let's focus on two regions for now. This we are going to be calling as the region A, uh, primary region, and this we are going to be calling as the secondary region. Okay, We continue to use the Azure SQL services in the backend and all the related services uh, that we always talked about, application insights, backup services, Key volts, Azure storage. One area, one service which is missing here is the the container registry. That's something that is uh, you know that always needs to be there. Uh, the Azure SQL databases. We are going to be using the Azure SQL services, and then you have the CD pod and the CM pod and the XConnect pods and the application gateway ingress control pod. I've already given the brief description about the what is the application gateway ingress controller? What's its role? So I'm going to be skipping this here. You can go and check the, the older videos. I've not listed all the other pods here. For example, the reporting, the processing, the Cortex, uh, you know, uh, Cortex reporting, processing, marketing automation, XTP reference data. There are so many other services that runs in the backend. I've not listed here. Rather from a graph, you know, just from a representation point of view, I've just combined them all into one. Okay. And then you have the CD pod, pretty standard, and the CM pod. Okay. Similarly, in the in the secondary, okay, you don't really need all these services that I just talked about here in the X Connect. Only thing that you need is one CD pod. Okay. What we are doing essentially here is we are building a VNet pairing between between the region A and the region B. Okay. This is going to be a different VNet. This is going to be a different VNet, and we have enabled the VNet pairing. Why? The reason being is that the CD pod uh, would need to go and connect to some of the databases here and also would need to go and connect to some of the services that runs on the primary. Uh, there's no there's no reason why you need to have all the services duplicated here because it's not it's not uh, an efficient way of doing it. The right way of then it becomes a kind of an cold DR, right? We are not trying to do that. What we are trying to do here is we want both the environments to run in parallel and serve the traffic. Okay. And hence. We have the CD pod, one single CD pod uh, mentioned here with one single web database here. The application gateway ingress control that would go and uh, make sure the information related to this CD pod is updated always here. Okay. But essentially, you need this VNet pairing. There are a few other services that runs here and here also that uh, Sri will talk about. For example, the load balancer, the services. Uh, runs on the load balancers and few other things. Before I come on to the application gateway here, I just want to touch upon that uh, though this uh, diagram represents solar as external, but for the purpose of this, we might just be even you know using an internal world too. That's going to be completely okay, but you can still use an external solar uh, as a cloud with solar load balancer. And for the purpose of understanding, giving more clarity, uh, I have represented it here, right? But if you're playing, if you're learning, you can as much use an internal um, pod for a Redish or for solar also, and that's going to be completely okay. Okay. Now, a lot about how we would set it up in the back end. Let's see how does this work in the front end and how does the traffic is really going to be, the external traffic is going to be impacted, okay? So we have an application gateway sitting in front of a region A, and we also have an application gateway that I X as in firewall sitting in front of the region P. What we are doing is that we have introduced a traffic manager here. You can have any other services too. Like for example, you can also have an um, additional application gateway and that should be completely okay. 
But for this demo, we have introduced in traffic management, considering that these are going to be two different regions. Now, if you're using region within the same country, for example, if you're setting it up for US East and US West, um, you probably do not want to even have multi-region, right? I mean, you can certainly do two pods here. The purpose of doing the multi-region is say, for example, if you have client base in US and then if you have client base in, in the Europe region, that's where the significance of the multi-region increases. If you're setting up in single uh, country, you probably be better off doing multiple pods here instead of doing one CD pods. Uh, even in this situation also, when we're introducing multi-region, we can still have multi pods here. The CD pods I'm specifically talking about, CM is always going to be one. But then uh, in, in case when you're doing the multi-region, it always makes sense to have uh, two different continents, right? You're doing one setup in US, you're doing second setup in, in Europe or maybe in Asia, and that's where the traffic manager comes into the picture. So from an ideal situation point of view, we have tried to represent a traffic manager here. So anyone who's originating, let's consider that the lower portion is coming in from Europe region and the upper portion here is coming from the US market, okay? Uh, if this is coming in from the Europe, anyone originating from the, from the Europe, going to the traffic manager, traffic manager finding out, okay, where is this user originating from? Which is the nearest endpoint? Giving back the information to the user, the user directly ending it up on, on that application gateway here. That's the whole purpose of setting it up in a way where you have multi-region, the traffic manager takes care of the uh, distribution or uh, rather providing the DNS information back to the client and then the client going to the application gateways uh, directly, okay? This application gateway also acts as a uh, firewall, which means if there are internal users and that those internal users could also be at multiple locations. But for this demo, we have assumed that this, the internal users are going to be at one single location and they are always going to be coming in from this region. Okay, And instead of going into the traffic manager, we have directly told them to go to the application gateway, which is in the US region. And from there on, they are going to be coming on to the CM pod here. The traffic is going to be obviously always filtered uh, when it comes to the internal users. Give me a second, please. When you work from home, you hear a lot of background noise, so you have to keep going mute <laughs> um, so that it doesn't get recorded. All right, so the internal users are always going to be coming into this application gateway directly. And when we do all the filters here so that the users originating from the users originating from certain region locations, IP addresses are only allowed and the rest of them are not allowed. If had it been a situation where the user are also originating from a different uh, region, for example, um, a Europe region, then we would, you know, we would probably probably prefer them to still go to this one because the CM sits here. We don't really want them to go to the traffic manager because we don't really have a have two traf have two CMs here, right? This one CM and this one CM is always going to be serving the traffic from here. So it makes sense for the users to always go to three to this uh, application gateway. Okay. This portion that works in the backend is always going to be internal portion. It's always hidden. Uh, how many number of environments you create. But if you are going to be doing it um, for the traffic manager or for the application gateway, they're always going to be public facing. Going forward, you will also see that, you know, we will try to introduce blue and green, hot and cold, you know, a lot of uh, terminologies being used there. We will do the demos on that. But for now, this is the architectural diagram that we are going to be following in this demo. Okay, we will try to switch over the traffic. We'll see if the time permits, we will. Otherwise, what we will do is that we probably will have a second session where we will also do the switch over in the traffic and um, you should be able to see the traffic. What we are doing, an additional thing that you need to know and I'll, I've always spoken about it is we have two nodes defined here, okay? The nodes part of the cluster if the production environment always preferred three nodes, again, it's a preferred choice. You can have two also, you can probably do four also, but in an ideal situation from a best practices point of view, it's always recommended. 
to have three nodes. For the purpose of this demo, we probably are going to be using two nodes. Um, we are not going to be doing much for now. Um, scalability point of view, that's something uh, we will touch upon in the future subjects, uh, not for now. So that's about it for the, for the architectural diagram. Remember, there are a few key points when you're doing in multi-region based on our experience. In the future, we might do it in a different manner. Uh, maybe we use a service uh, fabric in the future. It's going to be a different topic. But then for now, what we're doing is we're using the VNet pairing. There are certain services that needs to be exposed on a load balancer. Okay, And that is something that Sri will talk about so that this CD pod can talk to some of the pods here and can also connect to some of the databases here. Okay, That's about it from an architecture point of view. Let me move back to the slides and see what do we have next. Okay. So we talked about the arc and, and you know, you can see, you know, what I've tried to show you here is the number of pods that will run in the back end, right? The cortex and processings and reportings and automations and everything in the container registry also. Right. So when I was showing you in a different uh, PDF, I just wanted to do it on a very, uh, very high level. And uh, when I'm trying to show it to you, where I, I, you know, I've just seen shown you the single region. So I've tried to go a little more elaborated way. I've also tried to show you three um, nodes here. Okay. But uh, when I was showing the overall architecture, I tried to concise it so that you understand. But imagine your one single region is going to look like this, okay? It's going to be having CD, CMs, everything running in the backend, including Redish and Solar. If you're learning, as per the site core practices, three things you should always keep out of the Kubernetes. That is Solar, it should always be out, okay? Uh, the uh, SQLs, uh, they have choice, either you can go on to the virtual machines or you can certainly use the Azure SQL as a services too. Redish, we are going to be using Azure Redish and uh, though I've shown it here, but that's more from a learning point of view, okay? Now I am going to hand it over to Sri. He's going to show you how the manifest files are written and uh, he'll walk through you to the cluster IPs and uh, you know some of the other settings that we have done already in the Kubernetes file. So Sri, over to you. I'm going to be stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Hadeep. Uh, let me share my screen, folks. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, first thing is I want to show you uh, how exactly the server looks like, or I can say a little more, more probably like uh, the, how our cluster looks like. As you can see here, right, I have uh, two clusters. So one is you can see like a, a broad cluster, primary cluster, as well as a secondary cluster. So one thing you need to observe here is uh, this is the in East US. See the prod primary PRI is in the East US running on 1.2.2. Uh, it is the latest one uh, supported by uh, the Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes services, as well as we have the, uh, the environment uh, distributed in, or I can say like a, it's a separately separate environment, a new environment, uh, which will be in the West US. So this will be our DR and this will be our primary. Now, uh, at the high level, if I go inside to give at a high level, so you can see here, if I go to the workloads, uh, I just want to give you an overview about like how many pods it will be running. As you can see, uh, if I just go to the default namespace, and um, these are the pods which will be so most probably if i select everything so these are all the pods which will be running if you want to have uh, <clears throat> a site core application on kubernetes these are the things you need to run and there are some extra pods here which is for for our reference like ms sql and everything for our testing purpose everything so so now getting this up and running uh, you can do it in two different ways one is the hard part by doing it manually. The other one is uh, doing it through the Azure pipelines, which I'm going to show you uh, in a few more minutes. Before even going to do that one, right? we need to look into uh, the manifest actually. So if I go here, now, as you can see, these are the a few manifest which we're going to use going to deploy uh, uh, the names are just like uh, this is a CD and this is your configuration manager uh, all, all these things these are these are the each one will have if I go inside it's a very big file and uh, it's a very time consuming to explain everything so we have customized this one so yes uh, 
uh, site our site core has given us uh, the the base prints and we have uh, uh, made it more better by improvising and a uh, lot of rigorous testing was being done and apart from that we also have the ingress one thing we did uh, here is we have integrated application gateway uh, along with the site core so uh, in the uh, initial documentation it was not there but uh, we have integrated and um, uh, if i go back and show it to you to give an, a rough idea uh, so if i go here and give like application gateways and this is the application gateway will be which will be acting as a ingress controller we're going to have an in detailed discussion in future about this one uh, along with the failover but i just want to show you like how it will be uh, like it is going to if you go to the listeners you see a lot of every service community service have the listener i'm going to go in detail in uh, futures uh, future stuff now go back we can divide into multiple things one is to deploy the base infrastructure like all the ports like cd cm uh, id xdb collection reference and uh, as hardeep has stated that one right we are using uh, uh, the database the uh, sql database as well as the solar as well as uh, redis which is external and it is a recommendations given by sitecore itself so this requires very very huge performance and ideally ideally kubernetes itself don't recommend to put databases as uh, ports actually as containers so it's better to be outside and we are using platform as a service uh, both for uh, uh, azure redis as well as uh, the sql and uh, solar it will be a cluster apart from that we also have uh, the secrets uh, if i say secrets like these these are actually the ssl certificates which we need to create and uh, uh, the one thing what we did good here is we have integrated a lot of components actually like like uh, we, we we have integrated if i go to the pipeline by the way to, to show you the extent of the integration what we did right uh, let me take you let me take you the release pipelines and this is a pipeline i'm going to talk about if you go to the release and uh, this is our team uh, which has uh, created a multi-stage pipeline here as you can notice so including the 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 things which we have integrated as you can see that we have integrated the key vault we have automated all the way uh, to we're going to put all the passwords uh, in uh, just like a like this actually we're going to put all the passwords in a json file and uh, to 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 make it less hassle for the customer or for the engineer to deploy so automatically all the passwords will be created into the key vault and they'll be created in the kubernetes we have integrated uh, uh, the azure sql we have integrated the azure kubernetes as well as if you go like endpoints as well as like uh, solar and uh, we are deploying a site core manifest and totally at the finally we are even integrated a uh, dr services as well as web application firewall as well so totally it will be a 16 i think 14 stages uh, fire, uh, stages pipeline actually one click uh, will be what will happen it is going to take the latest you see this is a branch custom vineyard branch which is going to take all this code actually this code and it sequentially it is going to run all the all the stages here and the end result will be something what you are seeing right now here actually a working a working kubernetes cluster and if you see this kubernetes cluster we have two things actually and there is a some manual job included here or involved here i can say why because once uh, the primary cluster was been created it is it is uh, our responsibility to gather some information and we need to create the secondary server even the second sorry secondary kubernetes uh, cluster even that is actually automated so using the same pipeline but there will be some manual tasks like even it can be automated we'll do that in future as well uh, like getting the services uh, the primary server should be reachable to the secondary cluster uh, like uh, uh, redis like solar and, and we have xdb collection and other stuff so so it will be like both will be active at the same time uh, okay so next thing is but again as uh, uh, when you see the architecture both are basically uh, two different clusters and how about i'm going to provide a fault tolerance or what is my dr strategy here so we're going to use obviously the azure dns as well as the traffic manager to make everything as a single solution so that the my primary cluster in case of uh, unexpected catastrophe so that the data should be actually uh, diverted or i can say like a failover to the secondary uh, now if i go back here 
if i go and go to the traffic manager which you can see so this is the one which we have created and if i go inside as you can see this is my primary uh, the primary one which you can see it is online and uh, we are using the priority so the one which is actually go to my primary kubernetes cluster the second one is a uh, secondary site code which is a secondary so if in case of if i want to divert the traffic or it is all automatically failure will be there in case of uh, the monitoring status is degraded or go, endpoint goes offline automatically it will go or if i want to manually route the traffic to my secondary if i need to perform some rolling updates or upgrades or some sort of a maintenance right i can change the priority and i can actually send all my traffic to the secondary so this is one and uh, we can also get the traffic view once we enabled and everything but it, it was a demo for demo purpose i have configured this one now again uh, if you see this is a traffic manager and uh, this is my the url actually and what will happen is and uh, our best friend dns is here which which we are actually going to create a c name record for this uh, complete dns name so if i punch into dns zones one thing we'll observe here now oh, let me go here so <clears throat> okay let me load more okay give me one minute zoom is coming and interfering in between okay good so if i have a ww2 uh, because the ww was been used by uh, a different purpose so i have the website the subdomain is ww2 uh, c name which is actually going to the traffic manager that means what i can basically do here i can actually open a incognito window and ww2.hi.zone which you're going to get into this one okay so this is this is actually the working site and uh, and even i can actually go back and even configure uh, i can say like uh, cm hyphen k test i should uh, basically <clears throat> i have configured and you're going to get even i go into the management uh, by using the site core as well we can block this one by the way so right now as you can see i'm able to go here uh, we are able to log in let me show you we can log in because i have disabled the firewall actually because it's not straight straightforward people is going to log in here uh, one thing what what i did was uh, to for the demo purposes one thing what i did was uh, if i go to the application gateway in application gateway uh, i have basically if you come to the web application firewall uh, i have kept in detection mode if i put on protection uh, prevention mode i need to add some extra or i need to uh, disable some few few firewall features then only you able to come here that means even i can restrict the management uh, page only for certain client ip addresses basically and from that the high level if you see this is completely running on kubernetes folks completely running on kubernetes it is not uh, running on is servers okay now further uh, i think uh, going into the pipelines by the way i already told you the pipelines uh, how it looks like is so it is it is very straightforward and i'd say it's a tremendous amount of work was been kept in this one and uh, we have configured in such a way we have two pipelines one is for a primary purpose and uh, the other one is uh, basically for the secondary purpose now if i run some few commands to make you to understand uh, how it looks like um, let me let me do this so let me make a little bigger so if i say like uh, kubectl get pods okay and these are the pods and how can i count it so i'll do one thing i'll say like uh, <clears throat> so it looks like i have somewhere like uh, some 23 pods which are running i think some some init containers are there and uh, specifically if you see k you get uh, pods and um, you can see these are the two pods actually the important thing you need to understand how the cluster how the cluster was been uh, uh, set up so if i go inside uh, to the cluster so let me go inside to the cluster <clears throat> this is a primary cluster and if i go to the node pools and how many how many nodes are running as you can see three nodes are running by the way so we have three different nodes and what will happen is kubernetes will automatically distribute the load across the machine so to confirm that one let me show you something if i say as a kget boss hyphen wide uh, hyphen l app uh, is equal to cd blue <clears throat> and you see 
Okay, uh, looks like these are basically deployed into only one machine right now. So normally if I increase this one to make you to understand if I increase the number of pods, right? So what will happen? Uh, I can increase whatever I like. For example, what I can do if the load is coming up, we have something called as a uh, uh, cube CTL get HPA. It's not it's a overkill right now to explain this one. So what will happen? It will normally distribute the load right now. Since the load is below 80%, it is just showing two ports. In future, we're going to show you even how these ports will can raise to 10 and distribute it across the machines, by the way, across the machines right now. Uh, if I say KU get no or kubectl get nodes. So I have three nodes, by the way. So what I can do is I can I can if I if I increase this uh, the number of ports which we'll do it later sometime uh, in the next time when I need to explain you about the reliability and scalability we have a separate session for that one during that time we're going to put the load on this one and it is going to drastically put a load and expand during that time you're going to see uh, you're going to see uh, like uh, there will be ten ports ten containers which you're creating and it will be scattered across the machines by the way across the machines okay so again if i say ku get all so it will have a lot of stuff like uh, it will show the pods as well as uh, a lot of like replica sets deployments a lot of stuff what are the services running overall uh, it 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 will be a little overwhelming for a new person to come into the kubernetes but uh, it's it's very good it's very good. Uh, the way the integration was being done is uh, very impressive. And uh, AKS was given all the latest uh, Kubernetes version. So we are able to deploy. And the dashboard, what you are getting here is also perfect. So because whatever I'm going to type the commands here, well, and you can actually see it here, by the way, directly. It was, it was very good. What are the configuration? Even you can deploy the uh, things from here. But uh, the recommended way is always from a CI CD pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks, uh, Sri. Uh, you mentioned about the CI/CD pipeline. We so far have been uh, mostly doing it from a PowerShell point of view uh, because it's much easier. Somebody who doesn't have the experience of doing the release pipeline um, would should start probably from the PowerShell and should start from a single region, one cluster XP single implementation. That's the right way to begin before you actually move it on to the on the XP scale on a multi region. Uh, let's go to the clusters, uh, AKS clusters, and let's just talk about a little bit more on the VNet pairing side so that people have uh, people have uh, some info in that. And that would be the last topic before we start taking up some of the questions that I see in the chat box. Sure, sure. So as you can see, uh, you can see like there are two clusters. So one is uh, as I said, in East US as well as we have in West US, by the way. Now, obviously, these are two gro geographical locations and there, there won't be any sort of uh, uh, complete, complete geographic isolation. And it is our responsibility in case of a failure, we need to have the secondary and they should communicate with uh, the primary services, by the way. So what we did was we have the VNet peering established. So uh, uh, one thing we need to understand before here, if I show you some services or, uh, to give you an idea. Now, here you are seeing something like Redis, uh, INT, Solar INT, all these things, whatever the IP address you are seeing here, these IP addresses belong to a load balancer because from the secondary side, this is the this is the endpoint where the pods in the secondary cluster is going to connect, but it is internally. But if you want to do that one, obviously we need to have a VNet peering. So if I go to the VNets and uh, these are the these are the two networks which we are using and uh, the address space, the address space, we are using CNI networking, by the way. So uh, Azure CNI content network interfaces because Azure uh, Kubernetes supports two things. One is a Kubernet and uh, the other one is CNI. Maybe in future, I can give you more uh, uh, insights into this one. So it's an AKS subnet. And important thing is if I come to the peerings, you can see primary to secondary, it is actually connecting to pro prod uh, sex series cluster RGVNet. And if I go here again to the peerings, you can see it is connecting to the primary, by the way. Okay, so that means what happened is there is the, the inter region. Um, Interregion connectivity between the East US and West US and um, what will happen is all our all of our ports here. So if I go back to the uh, The Kubernetes cluster. 
Kubernetes cluster. So what will happen? My workload should be able to connect to the services, by the way. So if you come here, you will see a, a decent amount of services in the D See, these are the services which are actually connecting to the primary primary region through the VNet actually. So what will happen? I have exposed. So we have exposed these services. So that means the ports in the secondary is actually connecting to these services which are in turn through the VNet peering are connecting to the load balancer, uh, which I showed you actually. And then it is actually consuming the services, which is in the primary. Yes, it will be quite overwhelming at the high level, but uh, yes, what at the high level? Yes, we have primary in East US. We have secondary in the West US and uh, West US CD port or CD is able to communicate with all the services or required services in the East US. Okay. Excellent. So uh, a question, uh, shall I move on to questions? Yeah, so um, like I'll, I'll start taking up the questions and I'll pass on some of the questions to you. Yeah. Um, the first one is, uh, is this uh, from Vignesh? Is this kind of ARM templates? Well, basically these are templates. Um, if you have working experience working with ARM templates, if you have worked with site code pass in the backend, uh, in the past, rather, uh, these are uh, these are YAML templates. Uh, YAML is a is a superset of JSON. Uh, the ARM templates that's provided by Microsoft or by Sitecore for platform as a services or for infrastructure as a services. Uh, these are in the YAML format. When you are working with Kubernetes, uh, YAML is the preferred way to do it because then you write the manifest files and few other things. Uh, sure, you would want to uh, go back to the presentation slide. Uh, this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, to answer your question, these are the templates, uh, YAML templates already provided by Sitecore. They are simple, easily, you should be able to easily understand it. Um, my suggestion to you is going to be start seeing it from an XP single. The documentation is available um, and then you should be good to go. The Second question is from Surendra. How much time it requires to deploy once release pipeline triggered? It all depends upon Surendra, what exactly you are configuring the release pipeline for. In some of the previous sessions, if you have attended, um, setting up the cluster is the, is, the, is the one that takes most of the time. The setting up or deploying the pods and the containers inside the pods are generally quick. If you have done all your configuration settings uh, in the right manner, it should be the cluster should not take more than 20, 25 minutes to deploy in one region. And then a few minutes more on top of that to deploy some of the other pods. If you have been working with the site core, you would know that when site core comes up, whether CD, whether CM, whether any of the other services, it takes a bit of time to spin up the backend and then build the cache and get up and running. So essentially, if we talk about single region implementation, it should not take more than more than 30, 45 minutes. That's the rough estimate that we have uh, understood. The second question from Surendra is, how did you generate SSL certificate and how did you apply it to different site code services? Now, part of this I will answer and I'll let um, Three answer part of it. The SSL certificate is our we have you know it's our own certificate. HI dot zone is a is a proper third party issued certificate. Uh, so how did we generate it? I mean the way you generate the CSR go and get invalid SSL certificate. The important question here is how did you apply it to the different site code services? Now, Sri, if you go to one of your manifest files and show them the uh, the seek TLS part of it, the TLS part. Uh, so, so you can see here, uh, we're going to place our uh, key as well as a CRT key as well as the key here. And uh, from there, what we can do here is here, uh, we're going to use customization.yaml. Uh, this customization YAML is uh, something which, which will allow you to create secrets as well as the TLS uh, is, is at ease actually. So what I can do, 
we can put it out actually one key is enough because we have created multiple keys but it's the same certificate by the way one one will suffice because if it is a wildcard certificate one is suffice so that means this these are actually uh, created as a secrets kubernetes secrets from there we're going to use ingress ingress if you see like we have a different w this is the, this is the one and uh, here we're going to use uh, the tls actually the, the secrets which we have generated we're going to consume it using the tls uh, uh, map here so we're going to use it all the, for every every zone you can see here whatever the name host name because the ingress works on the dns names for every dns name you're going to see here there is a tls certificate so it should be a wildcard basically okay Thank you, Shri. And as again, we will have different sessions to go in detail and just talk about the structure of the YAMLs. Uh, this probably, I understand the curiosity and keep throwing in the questions, most welcome. But uh, if you ever see a session coming in for uh, manifest files for Kubernetes, do join that because that's where you're going to be learning more. I'll move on to the other questions. Uh, there's another one from Bala that says, what's the CD odd spin up time how's the health probes configured now i haven't understood the first part of it very clearly uh, bala but i'll try to still answer you uh, so if you are referring how much time that the that the pod takes if they are pretty quick doesn't take more than you know a uh, few seconds probably to spin up quickly it's a side code that takes about a minute or so to come up and stabilize and that way uh, how's the health probes configured? That's the second part of the question. Uh, again, uh, Sri, if you go back to the manifest file and show them the health probes in the individual series. This, this, this is a probe. One is, uh, as you can see, this is a liveness probe and this is a starter probe. Yeah. Okay. As again, if you do not understand what is liveliness probes and starter probes, I would encourage you to join the sessions when we talk about more on the YAML files. There's another one that is about from Surendra. It says if contained author working in CM in cluster one, and if cluster one will down due to X reasons, can our gateway automatically connect to cluster two? during this switch will contain author experience some delay or downtime so in an ideal situation there should not be two cm servers we always recommend one cm server okay uh, the probability of the whole region going down is uh, pretty slim but then if it does then we will have to spin up uh, we can always have we can always have a spin up and secondary and keep it in the back end and not use them uh, that's completely going to be okay. But imagine how exactly are you connecting to the... Sri, can you open up the architectural diagram? Yeah. Let's just talk about that this CM is in region one. How do you actually connect to the CM? So you connect to the CM. Uh, we connect to the CM using a URL, a domain name, right? For example, cm.hi.zone. Now that internal user is going to, the DNS entry is made for this application gateway. This application gateway goes onto the CM server. If for some re, uh, reason, if this CM is down and it goes to the secondary region somewhere here, right? You'll have to change your DNS entries too. You can certainly keep a CM, uh, a cold CM in a secondary region, but then it's not going to be in a real sync. It's probably going to be, you know, you'll have to bring in the contains, you'll have to copy the contains. So you got to have a proper DR strategy. You can't simply move a CM from one region to the another region, uh, but then you got to have a proper DR strategy. Uh, I hope I have answered your question, Surindra. If not, feel free to write in the chat box. Um, I'll move on to the last question. That's again from Surindra. Uh, so for Sitecore XP single on Kubernetes, do I need to purchase the license? I think uh, obviously, you know, license is needed, but these days they do provide some uh, uh, temporary a month license or something sort of that last time when we talked about it, what we have been using is our own license to showcase the demo. But yeah, you know, if you're working for an organization, I would uh, suggest go and talk to some of the people in the leadership and tell them you want to practice Kubernetes, give me an XP single license. It's that's how it should be. Uh, from Surendra again, but our SQL databases are out of Kubernetes. Yeah, so that's completely okay, right? I mean, why do you want to keep the SQL within the 
within the pods that's not recommended so you we are using sql as a services and something that i have shown in some of my previous how do you set up the sql service i think it was a second session where i actually shown using the external sql services what changes you need to make where do you go and make the secrets and stuff like that uh, the powershell that i have shown and shared also is that something that you can you should go through it and you will be able to understand more out of it another one uh, so for site core xp single on kubernetes do i need to purchase the ssl certificate nope you don't need to you can generate your own certificate powershell helps you with that since we were doing a demo we wanted to do it properly we did not want to have an um, you know an exclamation mark that your certificate is not valid instead of trying it out the kubernetes if you have never worked with the dockers and and, and uh, it is the underlying container technology that's being used in the kubernetes do it on your local desktop do it on your uh, on your local uh, environment generate your own powershell certificate you know there are there are tons and tons of uh, material available if you google at how to generate the self signed certificate you should be able to pretty easily do that and site, uh, site core itself provides you a make cert actually in their repo so you can yeah. use that one as well yeah and they have good documentation site core also provides a good documentations uh but then see when we are showing the demo we we want, we would like to cover it in a vast canvas where you know in an idealistic world how would you want to do it obviously we cannot cover all the scenarios and the possibility so our purpose uh, since uh, horizontal provides and helps us out with of what with a lot of this kind of facilities in the back end we always have this uh, flexibility of using a proper certificate trying it on on azure kubernetes See everything that you are seeing is on a on a proper uh, Azure, right? So, so that's the benefit that we get working with Horizontal in terms of the flexibility that we have. So, talk to the organization, and I'm pretty sure they should be able to help you out with that. Those were the number of questions. We still have eight minutes. So if anyone has anything else, um, I hope I've done justice in responding to some of the questions. But if any questions, any other questions, please do let us know. And Sri, if you want to stop sharing the screen, that's okay. Hardeep, there is a uh, question from Bala, I guess. How do you How see? How do you see Azure CDN integration with Kubernetes? Um, well, I mean, how I see, fantastic. <laughs> I don't see any problem in that. The the probably the the point. could have been that how easy it is to integrate how difficult it is to integrate what's the performance criteria how does it work uh, is it even advisable should we be using an azure cdn should we go to verizon uh, something sort of that right so i uh, appreciate asking the question but you know i mean it works as simple as it 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 works with infrastructure as a services platform as a services and it should have no issues working with the with the pods too we do not see a challenge if you have referred and if you have been observing in the architectural diagram uh it's been uh, that's something that we have shown from an integration point of view uh obviously the changes needs to be there done on the cdn side too something that we have not touched upon because we have been focusing on the kubernetes part but that's an area that always is um somebody you know like me is always going to be interested because uh, that helps you in the performance part right cdn is capable of serving the large files they do not really have a cap if you say i have got a 20 mb of file it's allowed if you got 200 mb of file it's allowed if you say 2 gig of an file it's still allowed right so the integration we if i answer your question now from an integration point of view it's an area where we work with the back end developer so it's not the role that we play but it's also the role that a developer will play in terms of the configuration changes that needs to be done from the development side when you see it from an infrastructure point of view we are limited to setting up the cdn and deploying the code but when it comes to the actual integration with the code we would go and work with the with the back end developers we have been doing it for many years where with some of the infrastructure as a services and uh, platform as a services that we have been working so that's my answer i hope i have i've answered your uh, question bala all right uh, anybody else we got 6 minutes more otherwise um, um yeah you're welcome bala um, we have a whole series planned we will at some stage talk about the manifest files too 
uh, next time we are probably going to be showing the part two for this where we will switch the uh, you know the environments we reduce or we stop the traffic on one and move on to the other one uh, we changed our timing from doing it on working days to weekends uh, hopefully this this suits to a lot of folks but if you have any recommendations or suggestions feel free to put it in the chat window um, if your time recommendations or the days wise uh, probably kushbu is going to come up with a link um, kushbu is going to come up with a link the um, next time right yep. okay uh, we got 5 minutes more kushbu can you unmute surendra and see yes. if you got a question yeah i can i hope hello, i'm sorry to hello hi ardeep thanks for your mail and uh, for the material um, and i hope i am not disturbing you all to asking lots of question because it's um, it's in my interest to in docker and kubernetes with sitecore uh, so my question is sure. uh, related with the uh, as sitecore is pushing for the content uh, hub and content a is where they are taking care of your um, content publishing and in that case you don't need a kind of uh, platform for the uh, for the cmcd kind of uh, for the uh, arrangement so as they are taking care of so i mean do you think the clients will go for this um, uh, individual docker and kubernetes when they have uh, something that is managed by the sitecore itself uh, and for that kind of uh, platform where they are promising that it's very fast and they have number of benefit there uh, as a content as a service absolutely i have no second thoughts on that i haven't worked with the content hub yet i know it's it's a it's a new product that has come recently uh, i haven't really worked with it uh, all my 20 years of life and out of that 10 years i have been working with sitecore Uh, there's there's always been change that's always been accepted by the community and uh, by the market also so i clearly see that kubernetes is, is going to stay there scalability is one of the biggest factor when it comes to the kubernetes parts because when you work with the container services whichever it is right you're working with docker you're working with rocket you know, whatever experience you have uh, the point is that the scalability the cost is always going to be a factor i would have been able to answer your question if i had experience of working with the content hub but my my take on kubernetes is that it's there it will be there and it will continue to you know serve the traffic yeah i mean the same promise sitecore have uh, done it for the azure pass environment but now from sitecore 10.2 they have uh, suggested that they are moving from the pass and they are now moving more on the uh, api side and on this docker and kubernetes uh, side so even the uh, sitecore managed cloud will shifting their whole um, infrastructure from azure pass to the docker and kubernetes and uh, on this content hub and edge so that's why there's a valid reason to that surendra yeah. no that's okay that there's a there's a 100% valid reason to that that why do you want to move away from pass if you have set up if you have working experience with pass you know the cost of the pass is always going to be a big challenge there are so many moving pieces in the back end that that always becomes a big challenge if you see from a client perspective when the actual bill comes think about a situation in kubernetes aka specifically everything that you are doing is doing on a virtual machine virtual machine has got certain defined type of resources or things that works in the back end you have a complete visibility i've done many projects and pass um, in the past few years and that's an area where it was always challenging you put a ballpark estimate of pass and then you think about okay you know whether it is uh, it's going to end up in the same bucket it's going to be less it's going to be more ultimately is always going to be more so costing is one factor i just talked about scalability also now pass does gives you the scalability feature in terms of the instances but the instances when they spin up it takes bit of and time my experience working with the pods it's it's fast it's quick right and that's a benefit of using the kubernetes the the pass has basically it's a virtual machine working in the in the back end even for pass also uh, but there there are a lot of moving pieces that impacts uh, the performance of it too and uh, and that's the reason i think they made a right decision 
to move on to the microservices from a microservices point of view if you see pod if it's if it is running is it's only running is if it is running uh, notepad it's only going to run notepad if it's running sql it's only going to run sql so that's th there are certainly benefits to moving on from the pas to the kubernetes who knows tomorrow you might even go on to a, a serverless right we always change with the trend and we always go with what is being expected what is running in the market which, which is the one that is the 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 cost wise it is pretty effective which is easier to deploy have you ever deployed an pas platform with three regions with multiple instances it takes a lot of time to write arm templates now you think about there are there there's the, the yaml file i just talked about is already available given by by uh, sidecore and you should be able to quickly make some changes and keep it up and running yeah that's correct that people are always go with the trends and nowadays trend it's yeah go for the jam stack there you will get the lots of benefit from the security scalability perspective but sure. yeah i think it's a good thing if we are uh, from the cost wise yeah, it's always beneficial if we are moving from pas environment to the uh, kubernetes or it's a jam stack yeah so yeah thanks sir it was yeah so session. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, my dear friend Rohan, I'll make sure that you get up in in the middle of the night and attend this because that, that's what I want. I don't want you to sleep peacefully, Rohan. You are asking me to shift it to six a.m. Central Time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, we are over one minute. Uh, I hope you are looking forward to some of the other sessions we have been doing. Feel free to drop in your ideas and suggestions and thoughts and timings and expectations. We'll do. Uh, we'll try to incorporate them and help you as much as possible from a community point of view. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Hardeep, and thank you, Shreyas, uh, for the session, and thank you all for the joining. As Hardeep mentioned, we will keep bringing sessions to the DevOps series, and. uh we will also try to send out a survey for the timings of the session so that we can uh, accommodate more participants based on the from the various time zones yeah yeah that's it thank you all happy weekend thank you kushbu bye bye yeah bye bye all